So uh, just by way of introduction for anyone who isn't that familiar with the HSE or in the office, we were established in 2009 and we are responsible for the administration and coordination of the HSE or d budget on behalf of the Department of Health. And one of our functions really is to support um, researchers in Northern Ireland by building research capacity through creating research opportunities and supporting research infrastructure. And one of those opportunities is our doctoral fellowship scheme. So these awards are intended really to enable individuals to develop a research career within the HSC by undertaking research training, which then leads to, to a PhD. And the award will support the applicant's salary costs, their tuition fees and their research expenses. And the maximum award value that's available is 250,000. The remit for applications covers all areas of health and social care, but your project must have a clear potential for directly benefiting patients, service users, carers and the public in Northern Ireland. So the applications um, for professional and taught doctorates wouldn't be eligible under this scheme and awards are available to take up both on a full-time and a part-time basis. So just in terms of the eligibility for the scheme, the scheme is open to all individuals who are employed in health and social care in Northern Ireland, in the community or the voluntary sector, or not-for-profit organisations who are involved in health and social care provision, um, it's also open to those who are employed as independent contractors, such as GPs, or those who are employed by um, a recognised HSCNI training agency, such as NIMDA. And to be eligible for the scheme, uh, you would be required to identify an eligible employment employing organisation who would act as your employer for the entire duration of the fellowship. And that's just important to remember um, if you were on a fixed term contract that your employer would have to sign to say that they would cover your contract of employment for the entirety of your award. So all, any applicants um, who are accepted for, for the fellowship must be being accepted for a higher degree by Queen's or Ulster University. So in terms then of how we evaluate the applications, this is done in two stages. All applications that would meet our basic eligibility criteria will be sent out for external peer review and that would then be followed by shortlisting um, where they would be evaluated by a panel of experts. And this is done then based on a number of criteria which are listed. So the first of those criteria would be the scientific merit of the proposed research project. And this really um, would include, for example, looking at things like, have you clearly communicated the issues that you want to address with your research? Is your methodology logical and clear? And then if we look at the quality of the training plan and the research environment, what the panel really are looking for here is that they want to see you properly considered your training needs and that they would meet the objectives of the research study. Then it's really important um, that you involve the appropriate service users and the public as partners in your research process. And we have um, PPI members who sit as part of our evaluation panels and they really want to say that um, service users in the public have been involved throughout the development of your proposal and that you intend to continue to involve them in the research for the entirety of your, your programme of work. And then finally, you would be um, reviewed on your potential as a researcher. So what the panel would be looking for here is if the applicant shows enthusiasm, enthusiasm for the subject and um, whether they have previous research experience and do they demonstrate a commitment to a future in research? So if your application is lucky enough then to make it through shortlisting, you would be called for an interview and then your interview would be based on those same four criteria um, that were outlined in the previous slide. And if we take a look at what makes a successful application, um, I'm gonna just give a brief overview here because we could probably spend quite a lot of time on this, um, but in your application really, and um, then if you make it through to interview, you would be expected to demonstrate why you need a fellowship at this point in your career and what difference it would make to you. Um, so I think it's important to remember that this is a doctoral training fellowship and these are really high value, highly competitive awards. 
and you would be expected to show what skills you already have and what skills you plan to develop as you progress through your fellowship. Um, there's money in the budget for training and I think it's important that you strategically plan out your training. So, for example, um, you know, don't necessarily just stick with the university based training courses and um, you might want to, for example, look at training in leadership or courses outside of Northern Ireland. Then if you look at um, the place, the research environment and the team around you are also really important. Do your supervisors have the correct mix of skills to guide you through your fellowship? And will your institute provide the support that you require? Sorry. And then finally, the project, does it address an important health and social care need? And does it have the clear potential to benefit patients, service users, carers and the public? So, I think, you know, this could all seem quite daunting, particularly for applicants um, who may not already be embedded within a research environment. And to try and address that somewhat, last year, the r and office um, partnered with NHS r and Northwest to introduce this bridging scheme for pre-doctoral support. So this is our second year of running this scheme now. And the bridging scheme really is intended to provide individuals working in health and social care and um, registered professions, and that excludes doctors and dentists, um, to make a high quality application to our doctoral fellowship scheme or an alternative such as the NIHR doctoral fellowship scheme. Um, and it's really meant to, to increase your research skills and your experience through allowing you to develop your own tailored research plan. So the scheme um, provides a dedicated period of six months of support for the applicant to develop their research proposal. And that would then form the basis of an application to us or an alternative um, such as the NIHO or Doctoral Fellowship Scheme. And there's funding of up to £10,000 available. And that funding can be used for a variety of different um, uses such as salary backfill, training modules, travel expenses, or access to academic mentorship. So that scheme has just launched now with the closing date of the 31st of August, um, and with a view to possible um, interviews around September, October, and launching the, the scheme then in November. So these are then the key dates that, that you really need to remember, and I will leave it there and if anybody wants to contact me um, or ask me any questions now I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, so if we might move on to um, Marianne's presentation and do the questions all at the end if that's okay with you? Yes that's no problem. Okay thanks so much. Um, so hi everyone um, my name is Marianne Tinkler and you can see here just this is just a little bit about me and obviously Minding the Gap is just what I've been talking about probably for the last seven years. Um, and just to go on to the next slide, please, Clodagh. So I'll just probably tell you a very brief, I always like to plug my project. It's something I've been doing probably in my own time for about seven years, very, very passionate about it. Um, and I'm just so delighted that the Public Health Agency have decided to take this on board because I'm just, I'm very, very grateful because it's so needed. So um, this picture here is reminiscent of someone who's had, who I've recently cared for. She was a 33-year-old single mother with end-stage cystic fibrosis and a history of drug addiction. Because of her severe mental illness, there were barriers that prevented her receiving the appropriate palliative care. While this is a clinical scenario, this is a local portrayal of an issue that is common, not only in Northern Ireland and the United Kingdom, but also globally. And people who have a severe mental illness are not getting the appropriate palliative and end-of-life care. This is highlighted in the international literature that when you have a severe mental illness, you do not receive appropriate palliative care and you have a mortality gap of 10 to 20 years compared to the general population. If you're ho homeless or you have a minimal social network, it can be up to 30 to 35 years. And next slide, please, Coda. So this is not me sort of saying I'm the best PhD student ever. This was a cup that I got. I got loads of little presents when I actually got on this because I will go through the process and I still can't believe that I've actually got on it, but it's just to let you know that anybody can do this if you really have a passion for something. And I suppose if you see a real gap in care for people who are vulnerable or marginalized or whatever it is, and you pursue it, 
Um, this will all work out and it is, it, yes, I'm just super excited as you can tell. So my journey started seven years ago, my previous role as a Macmillan Palliative Care Nurse for the nursing homes in the Belfast Trust. On referrals for assessment, I noted residents with severe mental illness were young, late presentation to our service and probably most of the time in the last two to three days of life, alongside withdrawing from long term medications, physically agitated and really, really distressed. When seeking advice from mental health and palliative care professionals then, it became evident that we were in really, really silo working. I still work within palliative care and that's still quite evident today. Um, mental health professionals had little awareness of palliative care and palliative care professionals had little awareness of mental health. And I really needed to know why this was because I just felt I wasn't able to give, give the care that I did then. And just, it was just very upsetting at the time. So my MSc in supportive and palliative care was back in 2018 and this was at the dissertation stage. So I decided to complete a global literature review that focused on end of life care for people with schizophrenia. But the results also related to people with severe mental illness in general. Surprisingly to me then, it produced globally about 11 pieces of substantial evidence. Findings showed that people with schizophrenia towards the end of their lives, all they wished for was for a skilled companion. They had no fear of talking about death and basically wanted a good quality end of life care. And I really didn't think that was, that was actually asking for a million pounds. So this is why I sort of took this on board back then to say I needed to do something about it. At this time, I was also linked with other researchers working in this area. I don't have an academic or a massive research background, but I suppose I have felt now over the last few years that doing research is definitely the only way that we can change or tackle inequalities or challenge, I suppose, per practice. Um, so back then I had got, got to um, gather with a small group of, um, there's five of us globally at the minute, and you'll see just at the bottom here, um, you can look us up on Twitter and it's End in Mind Research. Um, so there still is only five of us at the moment, there's nobody else sort of joined our group. So we work within the area of people with severe mental illness and end of life care. So five is very little and if there's anybody else interested, we'd be very welcome to have you on board. So um, end of mind research. So we're from, somebody's from Canada, New Zealand, UK. And as I said, there's only five of us in total. So you can, as I said, look us up on Twitter. So I continue to pursue this inequality over the next few years, um, singly at ward level conferences or any given opportunity where I could make people aware of the inequality. Really, really hard going, very lonely. Um, I'm hoping that's going to change. And I'm probably still feeling like that today, but I'm so delighted that the PHA have given me an opportunity to, to get it all out there. Um, so to be honest, it was really fun on deaf ears. It was very hard to do all this alone. Um, most of the time it was really hard, really difficult to get engagement. And as I said before, a very lonely and frustrating place to be. So I decided that this large gap in care for an undervalued group needed to be taken another level. I contacted palliative care professor at Queen's University, Professor Joanne Reid. She said I had, I, I told her I had an idea for a project and this was me really going out in the whim. I thought I'll give her a call, I sort of know her from being online and I just thought I'm going to take a risk here and she just absolutely loved the project. Um, so we met to discuss um, the potential and she was totally sold from our first meeting. Um, and could I say that this process would definitely have not been possible if I hadn't have had um, Professor Joanne Reid and Professor Kevin Brazil. Um, he's a lecturer in palliative care as well. So you really, really need that backup and them on board and somebody to have a complete belief in you and your project. Um, working clinically for, for the past two years and obviously um, through COVID and submitting a PhD proposal was one way of daunting task. But I knew that according to the lack of evidence and awareness alongside my basic human values, to want to make a difference, it definitely was the only way. So the proposal was completed with my supervisors. All my own time was working clinically with two weekly deadlines. It was all time consuming and intense, but it felt perfect, cathartic, that I was able to put my values into some sort of action. So the day the letter arrived to say that I was shortlisted for the competition, I was in total, a total shock. Um, and that's what it said, it did say the competition. So when Sorka was actually doing her presentation, I was getting a bit nervous when she started talking about the interview process because it was so daunting. But 
when I'm sitting here now, eight weeks away from starting, it's it's worth every second of it. And can I just say that to everybody? It's worth every second. So the Public Health Agency Full Time Fellowship, as Asorka has been saying, um, I was told on numerous occasions was one of the most competitive in Northern Ireland and everyone has an equal standing at interview. So I was told that day and daily. Um, I was up against medical, dental, allied health professionals, everybody, we were all in there together. Um, and there was only a few of these given out every year. Um, and it, as Sorka was saying, it was up to the amount of £250,000 of funding, which is just an amazing amount of money. The next step was interview prep, which consisted of four mock interviews with a panel of four at each round. Um, I was given positive critical feedback, but on one occasion I was told, Marianne, you really need to get the big girl pants on and um, you're not really prepared for interview. So at that stage, I did think I was going to flounder and not do it at all, but I sort of picked myself up again. Um, I have to say my mock interviews were probably worse than the actual interview, but there was a reason for that because um, it's really, really fabulous experience, even though you're coming away and you think, oh, I'm never going to get this. So I came away and I just thought, right, I've done nearly two years of work here, worked at this for seven years, and I have to give this 200% or nothing. So the day of the interview was in February 21. Um, it was virtual due to the pandemic. Um, I prepared with a walking meditation, which somebody recommended before, in my bare feet in the room next door. Um, in my finery, makeup on, jewellery on, and I did my interview, which I know I wouldn't have been able to do that circa if you had me face to face, but I did it in my bare feet because a friend had said, just try and keep yourself really, really grounded, and it really, really helped. I don't tell everybody to do that in case you do need to be face to face, but it, it, definitely, it definitely worked for me. So I was nervous but ready. Five people on the panel. It started with the four-minute presentation, which closed at exactly four minutes. The first slide that I showed you was the first slide that I used. And that really gave, I hope, um, that was, I did look after a girl who looked exactly like that last year. And I'm hoping that that instills some sort of um, a human side of this project. You know, the, this, this is about people who have a severe mental illness who don't get the right care. So that's why I used, I used that. And it was recommended to do something like that. Five questions later and 20 minutes, it was all over. On the panel was a person with lived experience, as Sorka had said, um, he had severe mental illness, history of severe mental illness. And he was one of the end ones that asked me the question, a lovely gentleman, and he just said, um, Marianne, I want this to work out for you. Um, at this moment, I knew this was right. This was my path, and it now felt really comfortable. After all, I was the expert here, and I don't want that to sound as though I'm big headed or anything, but I was, I sort of, I know this project, and. I really knew that I was 27 years nursing. I knew that I was the right person for it. Um, so at this moment, I knew this was right, as I said, and this is my path and I felt comfortable. But I knew that when he said that to me, that when we have to have the PPI involvement, this is the main reason why you do these projects, because it, was, it felt real to him. He was going to be end of life at some stage due to his severe mental illness, he's probably going to die earlier than the general population. And I suppose if my project does go to success, that it will give him a real a tangible feeling that something will happen well for him at his end of life care. So the Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland have given me this amazing opportunity and I'm so grateful. I never thought I would have been capable of being successful for a PhD academic training with such a substantial amount of funding. This yearly opportunity is open to everyone and if you choose courage over comfort, passion for research that can enhance better quality of care, especially for vulnerable populations, please think about it and never think it's impossible because nothing is. So this quote here summarizes the journey that has now got me to this point. Me apply for a PhD in 50 this year. I've realized that it is important for me to live my values and pursue something I feel is right, and boy, at times it has been extremely uncomfortable, and I, I won't, I won't put you off that from applying. But it, it is hard going, but it's so worth it. So I've just about another two minutes left, and um, Sorka, you don't mind just pressing this. This is my project in a nutshell, and we don't mind just having me think about this, and then one slide after that. There's a little bit of music, so you can have a little listen. And thanks.
So I just want you to have a wee think, just this is me finished now, I'm sure you'll speak loud, but um, so I just want you to have a think about this has been my journey through all of this year and why this project is worth all the funding and more and how can you can make a difference in your work or personal life for people with severe mental illness who deserve better when it comes to the end of their lives, just like everyone else. Can I say that this journey has taught me that I have finally found a place where I truly belong. The belief and resilience that has been invested in this project in me and others has kept me choosing the uncomfortable over the comfortable and braving the wilderness. So the High Lonesome is now my comfortable place. Thank you.